That's what we're doing. All right. So to get started, we know that your credit score basically determines how um, likely you are to make payments on a loan. And it is behind between 300 and 850. And believe it or not, some people get to that 800 mark. I didn't think that was true when I was younger, but it is true, apparently. Mm. So most, uh, to just put it into context, typically if you have over 720, people consider your score pretty good. <clears throat> to buy homes, cars, to even qualify, you're looking at a minimum of 650 usually, but those are your lower rates. All right, so this is what makes up your credit score. This matters because you can do a lot to your credit mix and it's only 10% of your credit score. And so it won't make that much of a difference. So where you're really going to make the difference is your amounts owed in your payment history. <clears throat> and then lesser is your credit history, new credit and credit mix. But sometimes these small bumps in numbers can make the difference into what bracket you fall into. And so for your payment history, they're typically thinking about any late payments, um, how late the payments were, 30, 60, 90 days, when did the late payments take place and how many late payments appear on the score. And so there's a couple of different things when creditors pull your credit report. So there's the actual score, but sometimes if you're looking at a lease or something, they would actually look at the report itself to see what impacted the score. And then for your amounts owed, you're looking at the total debt. Where does it break down? And what is the total number of accounts with balances? And so this is where it's looking at how much that you have in your credit cards, how much that you had in your mortgage, in your auto loans, in your student loans, and what's the total number of accounts. So like how many accounts do you have with balances? And often this is when you'll when you pull your credit card credit report, you'll see something that says loan disproportionate um, amounts, and that's typically refer referencing this. <clears throat> your credit history is the age of your accounts. The and this is really interesting because it's not just um, the, so the average age of all accounts. They calculate this a couple of different ways. Um, when we're looking at credit history, depending on um, who's you looking at your credit report, somebody may look at what is the length of your oldest account. So if your oldest account is from like, for me, my oldest account, I think is from college. Um, so I'm about to age myself because it's over 20 years. But some people look at or some creditors look at the oldest account and your newest and create an average within it. So if you opened a bunch of accounts in the last year, it's going to average that out and your payment history is going to look less. And then your credit mix. This is where they care about how many credit cards you have, how many installment loans, retail accounts. Those are different. So like your Victoria's Secret card or your Express card, et cetera, your um, mortgage loans and your finance company accounts, which are more of like those unsecure loan types. I also want to name that within this, something that's not talked about, but if you follow your credit score over time, you will see that retail accounts and finance company accounts can impact your score negatively. And then new credit, how many new accounts appear on your credit report? What's the open date of those new, new accounts, if any? And so they look at two things with new credit. One is when you made the inquiry. So when you ran your credit to be opened, and then when was the actual account open, if it was open? Because sometimes you run the credit just to see, the inquiry just to see if you qualify. All right, so the first thing you wanna do is assess your current situation. So when we send this out, you'll have the links you can get a free credit report from each of these. Sometimes you have to pay a little bit for your actual credit score. Um, however, Experian, I always promote them because with Experian, you can do a seven day free trial. And in that seven day free trial, they give you your credit score for all of the three bureaus and just cancel before them. 
I do it every month. I just like open it, look at my credit score and close it again. And I don't get charged just so y'all know. <clears throat> and so I see Bria laughing over here. They, I'm sure they get plenty of money. You also want to review for accuracy, any errors, inaccuracies, fraudulent activity, dispute, any discrepancies. You may not know this. I had this situation with my mom where like this person had ran 50 grand in debt before she caught it. And so under her, yeah, identity theft. And so it's super common. You want to look at it. I've actually ran a report before and had a credit card of mine stolen. So definitely look at that and dispute anything that comes up on your credit. Hmm. The other thing I just want to name, we went over this for the housing. This is an example of how different your credit scores may be. So you all, this is the reason you may want to look at something like Experian. If you, on the left, the 801 is a credit score through Capital One. So this is all the same person on the same, well, I'll just put my business out there. This is all me on the same day last year. Um, so I ran all of these back to back. So on the left, it's my Capital One app. The next one is, I believe it's another app, but I can't remember, maybe Lending Tree. To the right is Experian is the 759. Equifax is the 821, and then uh, TransUnion is the 750. So even among the credit bureaus, and this is where you see FICO score eight, it's the exact ca calculation, and this is three different scores based on what shows up on each credit report. So then what I wanna bring to your attention is on the bottom, you see it says credit cards, auto, and mortgages. Each of these, under, underneath them, I just have mortgages as an example, has the calculation that lenders use for that particular thing. And so for mortgages, they don't use your FICO score eight, they use your FICO score two. And you can see, even though it's a 750 or above all the way across for my mortgage is 699. And that's the reason you wanna pull the report itself and you want to pull up the credit scores yourself so that you can see what you're dealing with because it really sucks to go for a car loan, to go for a home loan, and that's when you find out you're below a 700. <clears throat> so as we talked about, you want to check your credit report for any error, dispute any errors, and target the areas you need to improve. So when you pull your credit score, it's going to give you these recommendations as to what are, so it's going to break down each of the areas, payment history, amounts owed, et cetera. And it's going to give you a rating for each of those areas. If I were thinking, I actually would have showed a sample. Um, and so within that, you're going to be able to see what you need to work on the most, because it's going to say like <clears throat> exceptional, good, bad, whatever. And so you can prioritize what it is that you want to work on, work on everything at the same time, but it also gives you an idea of how much you can prove your credit score. And what I mean by that is if your payment history, which is how long your accounts have been open, is an area that needs to be worked on, you're not going to be able to make that much of a difference to that particular area. Um, if inquiries is what you need to work on, you just need to wait for them to fall off and not create new inquiries, but they're also only going to improve, it's like I said, it's only 10% of your score. And so it starts to give you a little bit of an idea. Um, if you don't have credit or you have bad credit and can't get approved for anything right now, like that type of credit, something below a 650, you can kick it off by starting with a secured credit card to start building credit card. Uh, that and you can typically get that through, you can find places online through a credit union, et cetera. You can also work with a nonprofit credit counseling agency. And I point out to these specifically because credit repair scams are rampant in this field. People want to exploit folks. And so it is completely a lie when folks say that they can get stuff off your credit easily or whatever else and you have to pay a certain amount of money. So you want to be careful, go through a nonprofit profit credit counseling, and they can kind of tell you what to do if your credit is already, what we're talking about are credit scores below like a 620. If you're over a 620, you might be able to, like, you probably can fix it on your own. I was at a 620 um, five years ago when I came back from all of my, my year off of work and travel. Um, and right now I am currently over 800. And so I was able to pull it from a 620 to an 800 in a few years. 
but I didn't have like once you drop below a certain score, nobody's going to uh, help you out. So I think that that matters when we're talking about this. Other things to just kind of keep in mind is once you have negative items on your credit report, such as the ones below here, that's how long it takes for them to fall off your credit report. And so the one I wanna highlight is hard inquiry, um, specifically because when we're applying for stuff online, there's a soft inquiry and there's a hard inquiry. A soft inquiry is not gonna hit your credit at all. So those are okay to do. And so sometimes you can get credit cards through a soft inquiry. Um, you can get personal loans through a soft inquiry. The hard inquiries are the ones that are going to hit your credit. Delinquency is any late payment that you have. It's going to be on your credit score for seven years and so forth and so forth as you see here. All right, so we're gonna start with the actual um, tips part. So obviously pay your bills on time if you can. Another really interesting thing, I think this is newer, I hadn't seen it before a couple of years ago, is you can now get credit for your rent and utility payments. So oftentimes we don't have a ton of debt because we don't wanna bring it up. And so we have a hard time showing history. Um, you can go, one of the most common ways that you can get credit for your utilities is through Experian Boost. So if you log into your Experian account, there's Experian Boost and you'll be able to connect and then that will show the longevity. And a lot of us may do this thing where if we're short, we'll pay our rent and our utility first, even if we don't pay anything else. And so that is where our good credit is. And so you definitely wanna have that come into your payment history. When you're dealing, so oftentimes you'll be told that you can um, pay off your collection account. So something that I wanna red flag y'all on is that once a debt is showing off on your account as charged off, they're not expecting any more payments. So when you pay off that collection account, it's going to drop your score because it's activating it. And then from the moment that you paid, it's gonna take seven years to drop off. And so there is a school of thought that you just don't touch those accounts because they're not expecting for you to pay for them. Um, but also keep in mind that if that is the case, they may decide to pursue legal action to collect money from you, even though it's charged off. And so when you have those accounts, I personally like to pay everything because I don't want to be sued ever in life. Um, but if you have multiple charged off accounts, keep in mind that it might be a little better to save up to pay them all off because they're going to restart the clock on when they're going to fall off your credit report. And the, the later, the further back they are on your credit, the more, the higher your credit score can be. So it's not like they're gonna impact your credit score, uh, score indefinitely. Your credit score can improve before they drop off. It's just that creditors, when they pull your report, are gonna see that charge off account. Another mistake that we often make when we're paying off debt, particularly credit card debt, is that we are like, yes, we paid it and we closed the account that's going to hurt your credit score. And so you want to keep accounts open, even if like I have accounts that I barely touch. One of the things that I do with these old accounts to keep them active is that I run like what, like a Netflix subscription through them, my micro, Microsoft subscription. And so each of all of my accounts have like this one $10 charge on it so that I can have it reoccurring every month and then I just pay it. And it keeps the account active. Those are my oldest accounts. Um, because if you don't charge your credit cards for a little while, they will eventually, I just got two of my credit cards closed because I haven't used them in two years. And so you want to have something to kind of just keep your old accounts open. And another piece with credit is that there's a benefit to the credit card that something runs through it. Um, and so that is one of the things I've learned to go through to your point, uh, Bria, from earlier, is that if I keep reoccurring balances, like the $10 paid off, $10 paid off, my credit score tends to be higher than if I just run up a credit card and then pay it off. Um, and then the last thing you can do is become an authorized user on somebody else's account if they will let you. And so like sometimes parents, partners, et cetera, 
will let you go on their credit and become an authorized user. So what happens when you become an authorized user on our credit card is that you are going to be able to count the payment history from that credit card and um, the credit limit. So you may not qualify for a $20,000 limit on your own, but you can go under your parents or under your partners and they have a $20,000 limit. So now you are showing a $20,000 limit on your credit card and that's going to help with your utilization, which we'll talk about, I think, next. Or you're going to get their 20 years of history on their credit card as well on your credit. So it's going to bump up your credit, credit score when you become an authorized user. Now, you don't want to become an authorized user for just anybody because you also absorb all the risk with that credit card. So make sure it's when you're using it, you're, when you're doing this tactic, you're using it with somebody who's responsible with their credit. I'm going to pause for any questions. I have a question about the authorized user situation. So I know that if you're an authorized user for someone who has bad credit, that can negatively affect the mm -hmm. authorized user. But what about if you're the person who lets someone with bad credit be an authorized user on your account? Does that, that will affect, affect you? you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it, the bad credit doesn't affect you. Let me, let me uh, stop. So if they have bad credit, it's not going to affect you. I misspoke. It's if they do something negative with that card you are responsible for it but if they use the card responsibly their bad credit won't affect you yes you'll be fine cool do you know like specifically how it's possible to get credit for your rent um you can do that through experience boost typically oh, through the boost too. okay yeah mm -hmm. you have to connect it mm-hmm I also heard about that, that you can ask your landlord to report it, but that feels mm -hmm. like there's a middle person in that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Most landlords will only report it if it's negative. So Experian Boost is the easiest way I've seen to get everything connected. Um, and so typically, if you can't get it through there, you just can't get it connected. Unless you want to ask your landlord to do it. Yep. All right, so now we're gonna um, um, do the amounts owed. So this is one that's really interesting to me because when I came back from my travels, I owed over $80,000 in credit card debt. And so I had maxed out every single credit card because you know I was traveling the world and I didn't wanna come home. Um, so there's actual ways to do this. So I'm gonna go through this and I'm gonna, then I'm gonna tell you what I specifically did. Um, so obviously you want to pay off your credit card balances every month if you can. Another thing that you can do is if you, if you have high balance, higher balances is you can try to pay more than once per billing cycle, if you have the money to do it, because it's going to cut down on your interest rate. Credit cards are comp like interest is compounded daily. And so the more often that you pay, the less interest you're paying on it. You can also pay your credit card balances strategically. I want to name here that. The common thing is to have a balance of less than 30% of your overall limit. So if your limit is 30K, 30% of that. However, I've noticed that there's a significant difference in your credit score if your balance is below 10%. And so even though 30% is usually what will get you a good in this area, 10% and lower is what tends to be excellent. And then within that 10%, there is a couple of points difference every time you increase your balance a little bit. And so how you figure out your percentage, obviously you total up your entire limit and you total up your entire credit card debt and then um, do the division there to figure out the percentage. And so when you are paying down significant amounts of debt, people tend to use one of two strategies. Um, there's the avalanche method, which is where you focus on paying your highest interest credit cards first regardless of the amount, because that is where you're wasting, honestly, the most amount of money, given um, whatchamacallit, the amount of interest that you're paying. And then the second is the snowball method, where you focus on your smallest balances first, and you meet the minimum requirements of the other. And so what this one allows you to do is as you pay off each credit card, you free up more money to be putting towards the larger balances. 
But again, there's like pros and cons for each of these, as you can see in the chart below. Another thing that you can do is if you qualify for a zero APR credit card, there is a fee. However, you can get zero APR credit cards now for like 18 months. And so you can transfer the balances of your credit cards to these zero APR cards and just be dedicated to spending that one card. Um, that's why I had to remember at the start of the conversation that I just actually did that. And that's what I was like, wait, no, I do have that. Um, another one is that you could apply for a secured loan. So if you have assets like a car, a home, then you can apply uh, with the assets. Um, and that's typically a lower rate than your credit cards. You can apply for an unsecured personal loan if you qualify and consolidate into that. Or once again, you can become an authorized user. And what that does is expand your, high, your credit limit again. Because this is, again, amounts owed is a percentage of your limit. So one of the things I was able to do is just honestly apply for a whole bunch of credit cards to increase my limit, and that made my utilization lower. And so how I paid off my debt is I actually used an unsecure personal loan. So I ran for, I, I applied for an unsecure loan. It gave me a rate. So I think at the time it was really bad too because I had that credit. It was like 16%, but half of my credit cards had an interest rate of about 16%. So I took all of those and I put them into the personal loan. So that did a couple of things. One is with the personal loan, you're on a structured payment plan. It's not compounding interest. You know how much interest you're going to pay. So if it's five years, you're gonna, you know you're going to pay off that debt in five years, right? It also freed up my credit cards. So it lowered my utilization. Um, and so I was paying the minimum payments on those and then doing the uh, unsecured personal loan. And after a year, because I had the lower utilization, I wasn't racking up additional debt and I had paid down my personal installment loan a little bit, um, I qualified for a better rate. So I qualified for a higher amount and a better rate. So I refinanced that loan into, I believe, an 8% had a bigger chunk. So I put more of my credit card debt in there and then started to pay that one off and paid off the rest of my credit cards. So that's how I was like, there is like a strategy to it. You just have to be really intentional to not take on additional debt while you're doing it. Um, and there are with personal, unsecured personal loans, there are loans out there that are for what higher risk, I'm putting this in quotation, higher risk users who have bad credit scores, which is what I did. Um, so I typically recommend this, um, this, what I did, if you have high amounts of debt, I've had a couple of friends do it and they all were able to improve their credit score this way. All right, as I mentioned, uh, with credit history, the most you can do is keep old accounts open or again, become an authorized user so you can um, get their credit history on that particular credit card. For credit mix, so this one's tricky. So you may notice if you don't have a good mix of your credit debt, it, you can't get your credit score above a certain point. And that's because you're measured on having basically all of the above. So when I paid off, what did I pay off? My student loans and my car note, my credit score dropped because I had less of a mix of debt. When I put, bought a new car, interestingly enough, even though I took on additional debt, my credit score improved because now I had a better mix. And so typically you can do, a, again, once a, a couple of different things is that you can get a credit builder loan. You can get these through credit unions. Um, I think there's also a couple of sites online and what a credit builder loan is, is basically you are almost like paying into a CD. So it's an installment loan where the bank holds the money until you pay it off and then it gets released into you. So it's purely for the purposes of building credit. You can get a different type of loan, a car loan, if you need one. I would not recommend getting any debt that you don't need. So if you don't need a car, don't buy one. Um, but if you do, you can use a co-signer, right? 
You can also apply for a secured personal loan. Again, that's only if you have assets or in an unsecured personal loan. Now here's where it gets tricky. It does help for you to have a mix with the unsecured personal loan, but unsecured personal loans are also high risk products. So if your credit is already high, I don't believe it's worth the risk to do an ump up to do an unsecured personal loan. This is only if we're talking about like lower 600s that that might actually help your credit. But if you're above a 700, getting an unsecured personal loan will probably hurt you more than help you unless you're trying to do, uh, unless you're trying to consolidate credit card debt. Does that make sense? Because I just put a lot of caveats in there. Okay. So when you're going for new credit, now notice that I did tell you in a couple of things to just get new credit. And so this is how little this thing actually affects your credit score. For me, getting the new 0% APR credit card was better than worrying about this or getting the unsecured loan was better than worried of worrying about this. But in general, if your credit card is generally good, you do want to limit your lines of credit. Typically, it takes about two inquiries per year before your score drops. Um, and so you do want to limit that. If you are shopping around, say, for mortgage rates or a car loan, you want to do them all in a short amount of time, like within, I think you typically have about a week. And so that will normally count on your credit report as one inquiry if you do it that way. If they count it as more, you can dispute it because you can say, I was shopping around for a car, that's what it is, et cetera. And then it counts as one inquiry. And so that can also improve your credit score. And that is it. Now I am here for any, that was pretty quick. I am here for any questions. Oh wait, I can stop sharing. One of my questions is like, how do you know when something is going to be a hard inquiry versus a soft inquiry? Is Assume that like it's, it's usually explicitly said, if you cannot find it, I would assume it's a hard inquiry unless it says otherwise. Because typically with soft inquiries, you'll see something right before you hit the submit button that says this will not affect your credit score. If it does not say that, I would assume it's going to affect your credit score. It's usually only a couple of points. So you have to determine as well what the priority is at that moment. Does it um, negatively impact your score to do a balance transfer? Mm -mm. So if you're doing a balance transfer, let's say you're trying to take your debt to a 0% APR card. So if you're applying for a new card, that's going to be a new account opening. So that's going to drop you down a few points. However, it's typically offset because in applying for a new car, you also have a higher limit. And so your utilization decreases. So the biggest negative to doing um, a balance transfer is there's usually about a 3% fee at once. Most of us are not going to pay our credit debt quickly enough to um, not see that balance transfer fee as a benefit. And so like, if you think about how much you're paying in interest per month, it's much higher than what that balance transfer fee typically is. Any other questions? If not, then we're, we're done. That was pretty quick. We can stop recording. <laughs>